Hello and welcome to the Big Bright Podcast. Today we welcome Caroline Collier, Head of People at Bright and the person that looks after each and every member of the team. Caroline has an amazing 25 years experience in HR across different industries and is the reason why we're able to find, employ and most importantly retain so many incredible staff. We're also joined by Vic, the leader of all things brand marketing and culture at Bright. As well as ensuring our values are felt through each part of the company, she also keeps the mood up with some banging tunes and her distinctive cackle. With these two powerhouses working on staff happiness, it's no wonder we recently achieved the 2020 UK Best Workplaces Award by The Great Place to Work. So welcome guys, how are you? Good, thank you. (laughs) Good, thank you. Just to let everyone know, we're recording remotely today, as is the new way due to the big C word, the pandemic. We're going to kick off basically by talking a bit to Caroline. So you've been part of the Bright team now for 15 years. So what do you personally think is the key to happiness at work? Well, personally, I think it's the ability to be yourself. Um, It's really lovely not to to work in an environment that's not political, where you can be really open and honest about who you are, what you're feeling that day. You know, we spend so much time at work that it's really good to not have to play a part, but to actually be yourself. So that's a key part of it, I think. But also having really supportive colleagues around us, so they'll always pitch in and help at any point. Then the third part really is having some really interesting and varied work. Great so there's a big emphasis at Bright at the moment about ensuring new starters are fully supported from the moment they're offered a job. At the moment obviously the reality is that companies will have perhaps offered positions to candidates in the past month and they are committed to hire but they're having a problem obviously that people can't come into the office due to the government regulations. So I suppose the big topic here really is how do people onboard these hires remotely or online and do you have any tips for online onboarding? Yeah, I mean, it it is a big challenge. But actually, with the technology that we've got available to us these days, I think that it's a hell of a lot easier than we might anticipate. Obviously, people still need to hire and they still need to have people fulfilling those roles within the company. So I think just being brave and just carrying on and doing it would be a recommendation. You know, there are all sorts of things and techniques that we can do in order to actually onboard somebody successfully, even in the current environment. We can probably have, a if, if you're onboarding somebody who's not particularly technical, who needs to have their laptop set up, then that can be done for them in the office or by uh, somebody who is more technically savvy and sent to them with everything installed on which they need. The equipment, the right communication tools, all of those sorts of things can be set up for them in advance. So Vic, you're really concentrating at the moment on the company culture. So how do you manage to keep this going when you're trying to onboard somebody remotely? I think one of the key things, I suppose, when you traditionally onboard someone, the lovely thing is they get to come into the office and they get to meet everyone and they wander around and they start to get that feeling of comfort already, sort of just by, yeah, coming into the office. With people being remote, I think you have to sort of look at ramping up your efforts around company culture even more. And so recent times, we've been looking at that since we've had to sort of move very quickly to remote working. We wanted to keep some of our traditions going. So I think there's a lot of stuff around the channels that you use. So as Caroline was mentioning there and equipment and stuff like that, we use Use quite a few different sort of communication tools within the company. So Slack is, is something that we've been using very heavily. I mean, we used Slack before, but I say it's ramped up the activity on it probably more. We've created more channels for people. We've sort of created more meetings and we're trying to make sure that we add a sort of a social element into that probably more than we did before. So Slack was historically used mainly for business communication. There are a couple of social channels, but we've created a working from home channel and we've also created a parents channel because we have a lot of parents here. So we're trying to make sure the communication is really good for those sorts of channels and that people are feeling they're having sort of better conversations. I think when you're thinking about onboarding somebody you can just look at your normal onboarding plan and see how can you actually do all of those activities but doing it using those new tools. So for example we would on the first morning of somebody arriving, they would have a session with me as an HR person. They would also meet their wider team, their line manager, all of those sorts of things. And you can set up those meetings using Slack and have face-to-face video calls and just really adjust that plan to the online format. And it can work very effectively. The key thing is not to assume that you can't do some of these things. In fact, with these tools available to you, you can probably do the full onboarding plan as you would have done in the office. 
And are there any tools for conference calling? Obviously, there's so many available. Which ones do you use and which ones would you recommend to others? Well, we've been using Zoom for bigger meetings. That's been really effective as well, because actually you can have... I think up to 100 participants on that. So it's very, very flexible. It is huge. But one of the tips that we've had with that is it's really useful to have somebody facilitating those those meetings, especially if you've got like 25 people in them, because otherwise people talk all over each other and it's really difficult to actually have some sort of coherent conversation. But from an onboarding perspective, that's a useful one for getting to them to meet the whole team and see how the team interacts with each other and how that works, as well as having the one-to-one meetings meetings as well yeah and do you use things like google drive or do you use obviously asset bank which is your own software and bright yeah we use g drive for we've been using that forever anyway so that's the way that we generally collaborate on documents and get all of our work done certainly google docs and things like that are a brilliant way of, of sort of upping that collaboration we do actually only use asset bank our own product for a lot of file sharing so for images it's been particularly helpful for marketing i don't know if everyone across the company is using asset bank that much but certainly for somebody who works in marketing it's an essential way of being able to I suppose, share our files, our brand documents, anything that we need designing with external partners because we're using, we use a lot of freelancers to make sure that they've got either self-serve access to our files is brilliant. So that's a, it's actually quite a helpful tool. You don't really think about it until you're put into this situation and suddenly you realise that you need people to be able to access things online rather than being necessarily connected to a, you know, like a network drive. Yeah, it's a really, really helpful tool. I think that so many companies now are going to realise the huge importance of having the setup so I think yeah like a network drive just isn't going to work and if you're out of the office so it will be interesting to see what happens and we'll obviously talk a bit more about that later in the podcast so our next question I suppose let's direct this to Caroline at first because you are the the queen of retaining stuff and you've worked obviously at Bright for 15 years yourself and the average amount of time your staff will work at the company is about 4.6 years which sounds actually really good for a young company so what do you feel is the key to encouraging people to stay loyal to Bright? Oh, I think it's a combination of things. Um, yeah, and we're really, really proud of our ability to retain people for quite some time in the tech arena, which is notoriously, you know, quite fluid in terms of people moving around. So yeah, it is a lot of different things. I think part of it is obviously paying people right as well. It's a very basic thing, but having a reward system that is really transparent, having pay scales that people can see and understand where they where they are and also the progression that they've got available to them as well through that. So that's one thing. Then it's really about sort of making sure you've got the sort of benefits for people that they really value. Vic can probably talk a little bit more about this, but we, we did do an employee engagement survey to really find that out. Yeah, I know we've done surveys before, but I think this is quite a key one. It was the first one that I'd certainly run and it was quite an in-depth survey. I don't know if there was any hesitation, I think Caroline might be able to say, but about running a survey that asked quite a lot of quite deep or searching questions really about how people genuinely felt about working at Bright. But I feel like when we came out the other side of the survey and we reviewed the results, everyone had been really honest and we found that we could actually group the feedback quite well into sort of pockets. So it helped us then look at our benefits and see where people were crying out for something or if people were actually incredibly satisfied what we were currently offering. It was quite interesting when you talked about the offering people gyms, but actually people wanted different things. Exactly. So one of the things that people were asking for was gym membership, essentially. I had a look at that and I thought, okay, we've got gym membership on here. People were asking for us a variety of things, but gym did come up quite a lot. So I did a bit of research and looked into different gym packages. But then I thought, well, actually, you know, I'm not somebody that goes to the gym, but I might want, I don't know, I want to be able to take advantage of a benefit as well. And I asked a few other people. It turned out that actually what people were really crying out for was some kind of more of a well wellness benefits where we could maybe give them a contribution towards their gym membership if they wanted to go to the gym but then somebody might do a class like a pilates class or want a massage or something like that so we ended up coming up with a, a wellness contribution as a sort of the solution and actually it went down really really well and people are taking advantage of it so we offer i believe it's 15 pounds a month as a contribution to anybody that wants to take up a, a wellness activity people can go and get a, a massage if they want they can go to a class it covers a lot of activities so we've outlined those as part of a policy and again if people do want to take advantage of it by having us contribute towards their gym membership we just need to see evidence that they've got a gym membership subscription i suppose so yeah and that's it what actually worked out really well we take quite a lot of time caroline and i to look at benefits and we try and do that i think that now is an, an annual thing but yes i think certainly uh, doing a survey like that and actually listening to your staff and listening to what they really want or, or actually sort of listening to what they want and then trying to think creatively maybe how you can supply them with what they want is is quite a, a fun part of our job 
it's good because you then you're not just sort of putting a blanket kind of benefit across that you hope hits the mark you're actually really looking at what each individual wants and and making it as adaptable as possible to different people's needs really it's just informed our thinking for the other benefits that we offer people so instead of doing a health insurance policy for example we thought about why why do people actually want or think they want this sort of benefit what do they need it for and actually for a lot of people it's about if they do have a health problem about the security that they can get that sorted out quickly because they know it might have an effect on their ability to earn their salary so So thinking more creatively around that, we came up with a group income protection scheme. So if somebody's off on a long term illness, this insurance scheme kind of it makes sure that we can pay up to 80 percent of their salary for up to five years in the event of an illness. And this is very fair, obviously, because it's available to everybody and actually is not as expensive as you might think it's going to be. So it's a very, very cost effective from the company point of view, but also very beneficial from the individual's point of view as well. Absolutely. We chatted before about a topic that's obviously on the forefront of everyone's minds, which is mental health. But I think at the moment, whilst everybody's on lockdown and working remotely and estranged from their colleagues, you know, in person, it's even more important to talk about how you cope with mental health first aid. So can you tell us a bit about what you've put in for that? Yeah, a little while ago, we were contacted by St John's Ambulance about a, a mental health first aid course. So I'm a first aider anyway for all the physical stuff, but people don't really always think about the mental side of things. So yeah, I thought it would be a really good idea for us to go on a mental health first aid course. I asked Caroline if she'd like to join and she was really keen. And I also invited our one of our directors, Martin, to join us on the course as well, because we felt that it was an important thing to show the company that you know we do take it really, really seriously. It was a two day course and it was brilliant, actually. I feel like we all learned quite a lot and the first aid course to be really clear is we know we're not there to to fix the problem the course really is there to heighten your awareness of mental health issues but also to sort of help give you the the tools to be able to deal with a situation so as I say we're not there to fix a situation but we're there to listen and to direct people to the right areas of support for them I thought it was a really brilliant thing to do and I would urge if you have anyone in the company that would be interested in doing it I would definitely suggest it's a great thing to do it just definitely makes you feel a bit more equipped and I just think it's a it's an important thing. Yeah, one of the really helpful things about that from an HR perspective was knowing when you were getting into a conversation where, where you might be overstepping the mark in terms of offering support. So when to pull back and say, actually, I think you need to go and seek some help about this and here's some suggestions for where you could go rather than trying to fix it yourself and potentially causing more harm than good. So it was really reassuring from that point of view. That's brilliant. And I think it's setting a brilliant example and also just shining a light onto maybe a service that a lot of companies didn't realise was available to them. So I think that's great. And I guess the next uh, next thing that you're doing, which maybe isn't as sexy as uh, a reward system or a wellbeing contribution, pensions. <laughs> about pensions Caroline? Well obviously everybody has to every company has to provide a a pension scheme now with auto enrollment it's about sort of offering the extra bits around that as well when we first had to find a scheme for the auto enrollment process I found a IFA who's been really helpful to us independent financial advisor and we have him on a retainer not only providing scheme but also he can provide advice and we offer for everybody who went at the point that they join the scheme after their probation we offer them to have an online session with him so they can understand a bit more about our scheme but also he can talk to them about what their long-term goals are for their for their pension and give them some suggestions about how to achieve what they want to achieve by the time they get to their retirement. Obviously a long way off for a lot of people, but still, you know, the earliest people start them, the better it is for them. And he also comes in and does a once a year, does an on a face-to-face presentation to everybody as well, updating them on the fund performance and any topical subjects that he think might be useful for them. I love Dan down the pension man. I think it's a really great thing. I'll be honest, when I joined the company, um, no one had ever spoken to me about pensions before. And admittedly, you're right, it isn't the sexiest subject at all, but he does bring a sort of quite a lot of humour to the presentation as well. I think the other thing as well is it's really nice and reassuring as an employee to know that there is potentially some independent financial advice there because it's not something you always really want to think about or talk about, sort of pension-wise or money. Not everyone likes talking about that sort of stuff. Having him available to us, I think, is a really positive thing. Although he does make me feel terrible about my uh, myself every time he does come in because... I 
can't work out that I spend too much on going out and having a good time and not enough saving for I would know what the rainy day in the future I suppose it may well be here Vic exactly that rainy day may well be here <laughs> I really should have been saving I'm sorry Dan I'm so sorry <laughs> Well, I'd just like to say a big shout out to Dan because I feel like he's single-handedly making pensions fun. Another tricky subject, actually, really, is feedback and, and how you give feedback. So how do you tackle that as like an HR and company culture team? How do you ensure that feedback is given respectfully and positively? Well, we fo- we do focus on it a lot. We talk about it a fair amount and, and explain to people or hopefully encourage people to see feedback as a kind of gift, really. You're giving feedback back to people because you care about them doing a good job and want to help them to to be better and therefore you know it's it's a it's a sign of respect for them and and trust in their ability to do their job that that you are taking the time to give that feedback and practically how we encourage people to do that is everybody has a monthly one to one and also we have done training courses and things like that for people all based around the idea of giving timely feedback how do you do the kind of exit interviews with that sort of feedback? Yeah, so um, anytime a, a person does leave, then we do a, a formal exit interview and I've got a template for it. Um, I gather information from them about what they've enjoyed about their job, what they haven't enjoyed, and ask them specifically for recommendations of what they think we could do to improve our approach but in terms of culture, their particular job role, and also the team as well. It's really useful. Yeah, I bet that's really useful for then, you know, making positive change, you know, after they've left. It's a, yeah, that's interesting because I think a lot of companies can quite often just shut the door and that's it and they don't necessarily want to know what's wrong or like honest feedback isn't what made them leave. So I think it's to have a an ear open to that is just a, a really nice thing to do. Yeah, and it is useful to have a standard template as well to you. So you you don't forget to ask something like, you know, how did you feel about your pay and benefits here? And you can then feed that back into changes that you can make for everybody else as well. And I always share that that feedback the ex- from the exit interview with both the directors so that they can see what people are saying and the reasons why people are, are making that choice to leave. So the Office of National Statistics believe that 50% of UK employees will actually be working remotely by next year. Due to obviously the current circumstances, this is pretty much overnight turned to almost 100% of employees, especially at Bright. So with this really quick, almost overnight turnaround, how did you cope with everybody working remotely? And are there any tips that you can give other people that are maybe struggling with a remote workforce? Yeah, so I mean, we obviously could see that coming. So about a month ago, we started preparing for it. One of the key things, first of all, was to make sure that everybody was set up to work from from home. We made sure everybody had VPN access so that they could access all the files, servers and tools that we've got remotely. And one of our infrastructure guys helped everybody to make sure that they were all set up to do that. We were really lucky as well that we had a lot of communication channels that we were using online. So Slack was all already well set up and, and used by people and we've just ramped that up in the in terms of the usage and we would not used video calls at work on Slack before and now everybody's using those. Um, we've set up loads more channels, I th- as I think we mentioned, so that people can can have all those chats that you would have had in the office, but have them online. So one of the things that we've got is a set up a breakfast club channel on there. People can join and have that sort of in the beginning of the morning, that little chat you have over coffee before you start work. We can do that online. That's a great idea because I think those are the little moments of communication and those touch points that people do really miss when they're working from home. It's hard to replicate those, isn't it? So I think by having those regular meetings, even if it is from Zoom and just, you know, doing the normal normal chat you would do over making a cup of tea, it's really important. Yeah, it is. It is very important. That's something that we have everybody in the company, that breakfast club, but each individual team is doing things differently as well. So my team and the support team, every morning at 9.30, we have a team hello and we all get on the video link and say, right, how are you and what are you planning to do today? And then have a chat with each other as well. And that's really nice. It's, I'm actually really amazed and impressed about how 
how easily everyone has just sort of slipped into working in this way. I think it's so good as well because I think we had that trust beforehand with people working from home. It's never really been an issue. And I think the other thing as well in terms of the other meetings that Caroline was mentioning there, we've got the breakfast chat. We're sort of quite well known here for having a four o'clock stand up on a Friday. So um, every Friday we normally stop for drinks. The beer fridge opens and everybody gets a, a drink and we talk about what's gone on in the week. And we're continuing that. So I think that was last week was our, our first real trial of doing it on line so there were lots of they're not really virtual beers are they they're actual beers but anyway uh, we managed to sort of have drinks at four o'clock there was a one massive sort of company meeting uh, using zoom and then we'd also um, as part of that during the week we decided it was sort of your job to send in a photo of sort of summing up your week to show at the four o'clock drinks. So we're trying to inject some fun and some humour into it as we go because it is a difficult situation. And I think with, without humour, I think no one's really going to fare very well. So we try and bring humour and some fun where we can. So there were some really interesting pictures that people were sending in. We ran a bit of a competition for it. One of the ones that won was Ali, one of our developers. He'd uh, set up, I think, a dining room table with a balloon opposite him with a face on it, saying that this is basically week one of isolation was going well um, quite a funny one so yeah I might actually maybe add some of those to um, our blog because there's, there's a kind of a, a feeling that in terms of crisis or you know you know people feeling quite worried that a sense of normality and a sense of routine is really important so just keeping those moments like the four o'clock drinks probably and that ends your week as well that's how you end your week in the office so there's no reason why you shouldn't end your week you know remotely as well Absolutely. And that that point about routine is really important, actually. So we've kept all those regular meetings that we were having in the office. We have and we're still doing them. We're just doing them online instead. So it's keeping as much the same as it was before and just saying, right, okay, let's use technology to adapt to the situation. And so far, it's worked really, really well. So do you think that this will make it easier, you know, going forward when everyone is able to uh, return to work? Do you think that perhaps other companies who weren't so keen on remote working might actually see that it is possible and this could be an actual positive change? I think so, because I think they will have proved the point that actually you can trust people, that people will work well and achieve their outputs from home. There is no question that people will do their seven and a half hours. There's no skiving going on. And in fact, actually, it's been more of a problem to make sure that people don't overwork, actually. Oh, that's interesting because they've got their laptops at home and they can check emails, which they normally don't do at Bright, do they? That's right. And also because one of the things that we've said in this situation is, you know, you don't have to do nine to five. We've always been very flexible about that, but we've extended that even further. So, you know, there are people who maybe want to look after kids during the day because the kids are not in school who are therefore shifting some of their hours later into the evening. Um, So there's people who are working at all times, really. So you want to make sure that people aren't just nipping onto the computer after dinner all the time and, and doing more than they should be doing. Also, another way I've been sort of looking at it with my team is um, around project-based work. So, I mean, essentially, we sort of measure things in output. I think if people are achieving their targets and the goals, obviously, we we trust them, as Caroline was saying, you know, we trust them to work their hours however they need to manage that time. In marketing, we've been doing a lot of stuff on sort of project-based. So, you know, what do we need to achieve that week? We work as hard as we can to sort of get that done. But again, being mindful about people's working hours. But again, yeah, we've, we've just been looking at sort of project tasks because I feel like Certainly when we're not all together, it does help people sort of focus that they've got an actual, you know, they've got a small project to work on and they're going to work on that and then they feel a real sense of satisfaction. Yeah, I would feel like that's that's working quite well for us. Right, so we're coming to the end of the podcast now, unfortunately. Caroline, can you just give us your top tips for onboarding people remotely if there's any HR managers out there looking for some help? Sure. I mean, I think the the main tip would be look at your normal onboarding plan and don't assume that you can't do it. Just adjust it to an online format. We've got all the tools out there and the vast majority you can just get on and do. But in terms of sort of other hints, I think make sure that people have got the right communication tools set up for them. Be really aware of the company culture and the importance of helping people to understand that in an online format. 
don't forget about the wider company meetings. Make sure that they attend those and you set those up for them so they learn about the culture and not just their role. Potentially also assign them a buddy, somebody they can just ask any question of who uh, is available to them. On the social side, do set up some social meetings, you know, the breakfast club idea, the end of week drinks. All of that's really important to get somebody who's working remotely kind of connected with the team. And make sure you let everybody know in the in the company that there's a new starter and that they are encouraged to say hello and just have a chat and be welcoming. And also finally, you know, don't don't forget you need to onboard freelancers as well. So in this time, we are obviously using a lot of different routes towards trying to fill the skills gap that we've got. And that may not be employing a permanent person, but a freelancer needs to understand the culture and the way of working just as much as a, a permanent member of staff. So do onboard them as well. They are all very handy tips. So thank you so much. And thank you to both of you. Thanks, Caroline and Vic, because I think that especially at this time, this is going to be a hugely welcome topic for discussion and something that people might find very useful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please remember to subscribe to ensure you never miss an episode. You can find out more top tips from the Bright team on our website at bright-interactive.co.uk.